Good morning, DCC. It's so good to be together this morning. Thanks for choosing to journey with us. I hope that wherever you are today, as you engage this gathering and however you are showing up, that you would know deeply just how good and loved you are. If you're looking for ways to stay connected with others in our community right now, I wanna remind you that we have some great resources for connection, care, support, and spiritual formation on our website at denverchurch.org. As the spiritual formation pastor, my hope is that our community would know experientially what it means to listen to God and respond with our lives. In order to help cultivate this in our lives, we've put together a monthly online spiritual formation gathering. This month, our focus will be on gratitude. And so I will be guiding you through some gratitude practices and inviting you into some breakout groups for further connection with others. I look forward to having you join me on Sunday, September 27th online. You can register for this time on our website at denverchurch.org. Finally, we invite you to participate in giving as a part of worship this morning. Remember that all we do in and through DCC can only exist because of your generosity. Again, it's great to be with you today. As we continue with worship, let's all take a collective breath and remember that the Spirit is with us in this very moment. All are welcome at the table of God. 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 Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that many may become one. One heart, one family, one new humanity. For God, who is love, and Christ, who is all in all, show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality, count for us or against us. For the light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked, Christ the hungry and the sick, Christ the thirsty and the stranger, Christ the other. May God's Spirit hover over our chaos, our hatred and indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and serve and set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For we are all welcome at the table of God, every man, woman, and child. You may 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Typically in worship we are given the words to sing, but in the next few minutes we want to invite you to simply listen to the music and pay attention to the Word that is stirring in you. And so take some deep breaths and choose to practice presence with yourself. You are the dwelling place of the Word who is God.
Let's take this time now to turn to those around us and speak grace and peace. Hello, everyone. It's good to be together this morning online. If you'd like to follow along today, you can turn to Acts chapter 11. And as you do, we know that many of you are joining with us this morning and you are not in the Denver metro area. And I mention that because it's one of the things that's a result of our moving our Sunday gatherings online. I actually received an email from a family in California who shared how they were thrilled that we were online and that they are now a part of DCC. And so we welcome you, whether you're in California or those of you joining us from other states like Illinois, Texas, Michigan, Virginia, Florida, Oregon, Washington, to name a few. It's good to be with all of you. And if you're joining us from a state that I did not mention, feel free to add that to the comments on Facebook or on YouTube. Now this morning, we begin a new three-week season of teaching focused on who we are here at DCC. And every year we pause and reflect on this to remind ourselves of who we are, to recommit, in a sense, to moving forward together with a renewed sense of identity, a renewed sense of mission, clarifying again who we are as we move forward together. So today and the next two weeks that follow, we will explore our identity here at DCC. So with that said, let's pray, and then we'll jump into our time of teaching. God, we're grateful that we can be together, connected through technology together today. We're thankful for those who've joined us, not only here in the Denver metro area, but even from the places I just mentioned and even beyond that. We're grateful that we can be here, that we can be together, that we can explore who we are as we understand more of who you are. We pray these things together in the strong name of Jesus, amen. Now I'm going to begin reading uh, by reading in Acts chapter 11. And if you're following along, I'll begin in verse 19. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of these, this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It's possible that as you listen to me read, or as you followed along, you heard details or names or places, and it all felt like a, a little confusing or maybe cloudy. And that's because what we just read together comes towards the end of a larger story. And so to understand what we just read, we need to back up in the story as a way of understanding what we just read. Because anytime we enter a story without knowing what came before it, it makes the story difficult to understand. And so with this in mind, we need to back up to a man named Stephen, who was mentioned here. Stephen was, as it was written, a man full of grace and power, and his story begins in Acts chapter 6. Now Stephen is a follower of Jesus, and there are some who are in places of power who are not, I would say, big fans of his. And so they begin to plot against Stephen. They spread false reports about his preaching, about who he is, and that he's spoken blasphemy against Moses and against God. And it turns out that their plan works. Stephen is arrested and he's brought before the Sanhedrin, which was the high court of the Jewish people. And witnesses come in. People, they, they line up to present false charges against him. And after their testimony is heard, 
Everyone turns and looks at Stephen. Everyone is waiting for him to speak. They're waiting for his reply. And there's an interesting detail. We are told that as they look at him, his face is like that of an angel. Now, we, we may hear this and think maybe he's speaking of his radiant countenance or maybe it's like in old school where when Frank the Tank sees blue and he looks glorious. But the reference to Stephen looking like an angel speaks more about who Stephen is in that moment. It's helpful to remember that angels are messengers of God sent to speak to people. And this is exactly where Stephen is in that moment. He is a messenger. And we learn in Acts chapter 7 that he rises to the occasion. He's standing before a group of people who hold the power to release him or to execute him. And while he's there, he recapitulates, he retells the story of the Jewish people that finds its apex in the person of Jesus. And he's prophetic in what he says. And he finishes his testimony saying to all who are present, you don't want to hear this. You're just like your ancestors. You're a stiff-necked people. Well, those who are with him get angry and they sentence him to death by stoning. And Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, tells us on that day, the day that Stephen was executed, on that day, a great persecution broke out in the church in Jerusalem and they were scattered. Now keep in mind, backing up even a little further, that in Acts chapter two, it tells the story of Peter preaching and the followers of Jesus living in Jerusalem and people being added to their number daily. Which means it's not until the murder of Stephen that the followers of Jesus actually move out of Jerusalem. And some scholars suggest that they may have actually lived in Jerusalem for up to 10 years after Peter preached that first sermon. And however, the persecution spoken of in verse 19 is what sent them outside Jerusalem. It's what sent them beyond their comfort zone. So this explains why we read in the verses that we just read at the beginning they take place in the city of Antioch. Now, Antioch was a city that was almost directly north of Jerusalem, directly west of the modern Syrian city of Aleppo. And it was, according to the ancient historian Josephus, the third city in the Roman Empire behind only Rome and Alexandria, which meant Antioch was dominated by Roman thinking and Roman culture. It was a center of worship for the goddess Artemis and imperial worship as well. So when we read about this little group of Jesus followers living there, they got there initially because they fled persecution against them. And like Stephen, they did not back down when it came to speaking and sharing about who they followed, namely Jesus. But there's more, which is to say we're not done with the backstory. We learn about a man named Barnabas who hears about what is going on in Antioch and he rejoices. And by the way, we're going to get to that detail too in a few minutes. But Barnabas encourages all of those who are there, both Jew and Gentile, to remain true to Jesus with all their hearts. And then we learn that he leaves to go find a man named Saul. Now to understand why Saul is an interesting plot twist, we need again to back up in the story because any time we enter a story without knowing what came before it, it's difficult to understand. And this brings us back to Stephen's story. There's a detail given us when we learn of Stephen being executed. We learn that they take him outside the city to stone him to death. And Luke tells us in the book of Acts, those are the witnesses, which means those who would have thrown the stones to kill him. The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, which is to say Saul is there the whole time. Saul even goes outside the city with everyone to watch the stoning and ensures that those who are going to do the actual killing get everything they need. And we are told after the business of murdering Stephen is finished that Saul approved of their killing. Now the word that's translated approved actually has this sense of pleasure. Now keep in mind, stoning in the Jewish context had rules. The person being stoned was first stripped naked, if it was a man, as it is here with Stephen. And then they were taken 
and had their hands tied behind their back and they were pushed backward off a cliff that was at least 12 feet high. And if the person being stoned landed face down, someone would go down and they would turn them over on their back and then the witnesses would take large stones and would throw them at the condemned person aiming for their chest. And with every stone that hit their chest, they would check them to make sure that they were uh, alive or dead, and they would continue throwing these stones repeatedly until the person died. Now, you might be hearing this thinking to yourself, like, that is, that is incredibly barbaric. And if you are thinking that, you'd be right. And it, in the midst of this kind of execution, this barbaric, brutal death, Saul is there watching over the coats of the people who are actually throwing the rocks and he's deriving pleasure from what he witnesses. And it's in the next verse after we learn about Saul deriving pleasure from what he's watching that we learn that on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and they were scattered. Which is to say, one person central to the persecution of the, of the Christians, one person responsible for their being scattered was in fact the man named Saul. Because we learn that after the murder of Stephen, Saul goes on a campaign to imprison and persecute followers of Jesus. He's breathing out murderous threats as he does all of this. Saul is a man who is filled with hatred for and a longing to destroy those who follow Jesus. But we learn in Acts chapter nine, and he has a supernatural encounter with Jesus and his life is flipped upside down. Even though he has that conversion, his reputation still preceded him. So much so that the followers of Jesus who were persecuted were not quick to trust Saul. But that did not stop him. He, he began preaching about Jesus everywhere he went, in synagogues. And, and as a result, people now wanted to kill him. So we learn that Saul to, ran for his life and went back to his hometown of Tarsus. And sometime later, probably years later, Barnabas, who would have been one of the people that Saul wanted dead, Barnabas is in Antioch. And he's in Antioch with other followers of Jesus because of the persecution that had broken out in Jerusalem. A, a persecution, mind you, that was supported and led by Saul. And when Barnabas sees what's happening, he thinks to himself, you know who should be here? Saul. And so he leaves Antioch and he cuts across the northwest corner of the Mediterranean Sea to Tarsus to look for the man who once took pleasure in watching the stoning of Stephen, a follower of Jesus. He goes to look for a man who once traveled throughout the empire looking to persecute those who follow Jesus. Somehow, Barnabas felt Saul was the best one to team up with in this situation. Now, just think about how bizarre this is. A leader in the church wants to bring a guy whose history is more than suspect to serve and teach in the church in Antioch. Now, I can't imagine how many people felt about Saul, even years later. I mean, the guy has a really troubling story. Now, of course, depending on how they did things back then, it, maybe the story could work in his favor. And I say that because, like for me, when I was growing up, one thing that was occasionally a part of our church services was somebody who would stand up and would share their testimony. I actually worked at a Christian summer camp and every single time we gathered together, they'd have someone stand and share their testimony, which means you would tell the story of your conversion experience. And they had a formula to help you set the whole thing up. First is, what was your life like before Jesus? Second was, how did you meet Jesus or how did you convert? And third, what is your life like now? And to be honest with you, what was your life like before Jesus? That whole part was always the best. I mean, some of the people had like really juicy stories. Like they'd talk about hard drugs or their life of crime or insane amounts of drinking or rampant promiscuity. Some would share sort of details that were unreal. And for me, a 13 year old kid who grew up in a strict Christian household, it was amazing. I learned about all sorts of stuff that I otherwise would never have known because of these testimonies. And I can't help but imagine Saul coming to one of these meetings and standing up to share his testimony at one of those Christian youth camp meetings. Like, hey, my name is Saul. I grew up in Tarsus. And before I met Jesus, I was pretty messed up. Like, 
I used to take pleasure in watching people get executed by stoning. It was some pretty dark stuff. This is the guy Barnabas wants to have join him. So much so, he leaves Antioch and goes to look for him in Tarsus. And what is it that motivates all of this in Barnabas? His joy. We are told that when Barnabas arrives in Antioch, he saw what the grace of God had done and he was glad. He rejoiced would be a more literal translation of the word glad. And now this too is an important detail that might be easy to overlook. But if we back up again in the story, it will give us a way of understanding what we read in Acts 11. Because anytime we enter a story without knowing what came before it, it's difficult to understand. When we read of Barnabas rejoicing, it's actually the second time in this chapter that we learn about followers of Jesus rejoicing or or followers of Jesus praising God. The first time is a few verses before and comes only after their skepticism and, and anger and concern. And the skepticism, anger, and concern are connected to a Jewish disciple of Jesus who is in a trance on a rooftop in Joppa. The disciple's name is Peter, you know, the famous disciple who we meet in the Gospels that can never seem to do anything right. And we are told that he is a guest in a home. And while there, he's waiting for a meal to be cooked. And he makes his way up to the rooftop, which was a common gathering area in the ancient homes. And so he's on the rooftop and we're told that he begins praying. And he falls into a trance, like it's some altered state of consciousness. And while he's in this state, he sees a large sheet being lowered from heaven with all sorts of animals on it. And a voice from heaven says, get up, kill, and eat. Now, several of the animals that are on the sheet are not kosher. They are unclean animals, and eating them would be to go against the long-held religious rules of the Jewish people, the dietary restrictions outlined in Torah. To get up, kill, and eat would mean that Peter would have to willingly disobey the Bible betray his religious tradition, go against everything he has ever known. And so, understandably, he objects. And he says, I can't eat anything unclean. And the voice from heaven says, hey, don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. Now, this happens three times. And then Peter returns. He like comes out of this trance and he kind of wonders what that was all about. And we're told that as he's wondering what the vision was about, a dispatch from the home of a Roman centurion shows up at the house. And they say, hey, we're here looking for Peter and we want to invite him to the home of Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And just then something dawns on Peter. It's what the trance meant, what the vision was all about. So he agrees and he goes with this dispatch. Now to summarize the rest of the story, when Peter is with Cornelius in his home, He witnesses the Holy Spirit come on Cornelius and all who are a part of the household, and Peter then baptizes all of them. Now, up to this point, this sort of thing only happened in the Jewish community. But in this instance, the Holy Spirit and baptism, it spills out into the Gentile, the non-Jewish community. And Peter sees this, and he thinks something new is happening. But what he wakes up to in this moment is actually not really new at all. Because if we back up again in Peter's story, it will give us a way of understanding what is happening with him. Because any time we enter a story without knowing what came before it, it's difficult to understand. Now remember, Peter followed Jesus. And one of the things the Gospels note over and over was Jesus' rejection of any religious system that kept people, whether Jew or Gentile, that kept people from the heart of God. He was against anything that kept people away from intimacy with the divine. This is why Jesus was as comfortable speaking with a Canaanite woman and praising her faith as he was hanging out with a Samaritan woman who had a questionable reputation or spending time with the religious elite or the sinners or anyone else. See, Jesus knew the mystery, the divine, or God, could not be contained and was never designed to be contained to one religion. And he knew that the boundaries that poor religion enforces, boundaries that barred some while giving entry to a few, that those boundaries were not of God. But even Jesus' vision was nothing new. 
If we back up again in Jesus' story, it will give us a deeper way of understanding what's going on. You see, there's a story about Jesus where he's in the temple and he has a whip in his hand and he's turning over tables and chasing people around and he's yelling. And as he's yelling, he's quoting two ancient prophets who lived centuries before. The first prophet is Isaiah and the second prophet is Jeremiah. As Jesus is in the temple, he says, is it not written, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations? That's quoting Isaiah. And then Jesus continues and says, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's quoting Jeremiah. Now, Jesus does this and the prophets say this because what has happened is that the religious elite use the temple and its money and its power for their own gain while at the same time excluding others who longed for connection to God. Now, their anger comes because this was never supposed to be the story of the temple. Because if we back up again in this story of the prophets, it will give us a way of understanding what they were saying and why they were saying it. And in their case, they knew of the prayer of King Solomon. King Solomon is the son of David, and he's the one who built the first temple. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 8 that when he dedicated the temple, he said this, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, speaking to God, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear them from heaven, your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may know that this house I have built bears your name. You see, anytime we enter a story without knowing what came before it, it can be difficult to understand. And what we learn by backing up and backing up and backing up and backing up is that from the beginning, the heart of God longs to know humanity and longs for humanity to know, to intimately know the heart of God. This is even in the words spoken before Solomon, spoken to Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, when God says to him, all nations, all nations will be blessed through you. This vision is central to the instruction given to the people of Israel when they come up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and God speaks to them in the wilderness. This is what Solomon knew when he built the temple. This is what the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah knew when they raged against the religious and political machine that pushed some out and hemmed just a few in. This is what informed the heart of Jesus and his willingness to move toward anyone and everyone. It was this vision that led to his prophetic act in the temple, running around with a whip in his hand while quoting the prophets. And it is this kind of thinking that welled up in the heart of Jesus' followers when they were scattered. This is what Peter discovered when he visited the home of Cornelius. But after Peter's experience with Cornelius, there were some who still needed convincing that this was the case that God's heart was for all people to come to him. Which brings us back to Peter leaving Cornelius' house. Now, before Peter makes it back to Jerusalem, news of his visit, it reached many people. And when Peter arrived, they started criticizing him. They said to him, how can you go and eat with those people? This goes against the Bible, Peter. This goes against our religion. But Peter knew what they didn't. And that is, sometimes... Being faithful to our tradition means we have to betray it. And this is what he explains to the critics. He tells them the whole story and they listen intently. And when Peter's finished speaking, they say, oh, so the, the Gentiles are in on this Holy Spirit thing too. And the text tells us that when they hear the story, they rejoiced, they praised God, they celebrated and in the very next story, we learn this is the same joy Barnabas experiences when he arrives in Antioch, except he doesn't seem to need the convincing like those in Jerusalem. He doesn't need a trance or a vision. He goes to Antioch, and right away, he sees the same thing. The inclusion of the Gentiles. 
the vision found in the heart of God in the beginning and Barnabas rejoices and he leaves to find Saul because something in him knows this story he is in the midst of is far bigger than him and it's all going somewhere and even people like Saul with all of his sordid past are a part of this thing. And all of this happens in Antioch in the heart of the Roman Empire. And this new group of people we're from different walks of life with different religious experiences, with different opinions from different places on the globe. And they come together around the discovery of the heart of Jesus. And it's there for the first time they are called Christians. Which, by the way, was not really a compliment. And it wasn't really an insult either, but perhaps it was kind of a way to like kind of poke at them or maybe slightly mock them. Willie Jennings talks about this idea of being called Christians, and this is what he says. This is not the first time such a gathered group was called church, but this is the first time that newness found its way to a new name, Christianoi. Such a name, however, was not a badge of honor, but of ridicule that registered the strangeness of their song and of their sound. But like a new song that announces a new time in present time, it may often seem and sound strange. Christian, in its plural form, always equals a strange new future. Always equals a strange new future. Which means that while we've spent our time together so far, backing up and backing up and backing up and backing up to make sense of the story that we read here in Acts chapter 11, what we read is not only the end of a longer story, but it's also the beginning of something new. That is, it's the beginning of the Christian story. The vast, complex, massive story of those who follow Jesus, which includes you and includes me. A story that is long and broad in scope. A story that has parts that are horrific. Scenes that we wish had never happened. And things that are so cringeworthy, narratives that reflect poor religion and not the heart of God. But it's also a story that holds promise with parts that cause your heart to burst with joy, scenes that represent the continued struggle for justice, narrative that move toward the vision of humanity's deep and lasting intimate connection with God. And we're invited to explore this story because ultimately it's about all of us. You see, Anytime we enter a story without knowing what came before, it's difficult to understand. And anytime we enter a story without giving thought to where it's all headed or contemplating what it means or asking how we are implicated, then the story, it just, it falls flat. See, we need to look back to bring greater perspective and look ahead asking, what does this story mean for us? And this has been what the church, when she is at her best, has done for 2,000 years, just like those early days in Antioch. We look around, we observe, we look to see what the Spirit is up to and celebrate when we see her work. We witness the movement of God, which is always ahead of us, and surrender to it, allowing ourselves to be pulled into a strange new future. And today, we have inherited that tradition. One that comes to us with expressions from all over the world. One that has been written about in thousands of languages. One that has been sung about by people of every, as St. John says, by every tribe and nation and tongue. An expression and a tradition that finds itself expressed in thousands of denominations. Because how can any single denomination believe it is the full expression of the infinite mystery? We find this in the Adventist expression with Roman Catholics, Moravian, Nazarene, the Baptists, the Reformed tradition, the Wesleyan expression, Orthodox Christianity, the Coptic church, and on and on it goes. It's a tradition that includes mystics and philosophers and artists and scientists and preachers and social workers and mothers and fathers, earnest seekers and earnest doubters, the pious and the not so pious, a collection of people who are simultaneously sinners and saints, 
who fall down and get up again, bound together by the grace and love of God that comes to all of us and meets us each day anew, welcoming us once again into the heart of God who longs to be known and longs to know us. It's recognizing this is not our story alone. And I say that because I grew up in one particular expression of this Christian tradition. And in my immaturity, and in part because of the teaching that I was taught and that I believed, we, which meant like our little group, we were Christians. Those people over there, sure, they have their crosses and they sing hymns and they read the Bible, but they're not real Christians like us. But what I've grown to discover, and what I'm continuing to discover, is our expression was one small piece of this larger tradition that received its name in Antioch. Christian. And I point this out because this expression, this tradition, this word grew out of a group of people who didn't fit. They didn't fit within the religious expressions of the day that were present in Antioch. They didn't fit within the clearly defined political system and parties of the empire. They didn't subscribe to the common philosophical views of the Greeks. Rather, they associated freely with others who were not like them. They were not found in places of power. In fact, many of them resigned their places, the roles that they played in places of power. They didn't seek to be on top. The Christians were found in the forgotten, out-of-the-way places. They were friends to the, mar to, mar to the marginalized. They were allies of the oppressed. They were friends to the misfits. They were a group of people that no one would ever assemble, but they were bound together by the Spirit in the loving embrace of God. This is the kind of life, this way of living is not something that one aspires to, that one even earns or achieves. No, it's an agreement to surrender and open ourselves to God and to one another and to a larger story, always remembering that just as we here and now are one part of a larger story within the Christian tradition, the Christian tradition itself is one part of a larger, expansive, cosmic, universal story being held together by the life and breath of God. And this, this is where we find ourselves at DCC. And it's this expansive story that we want to explore and we want to do this together believing that all are invited to discover and rediscover the breadth and depth of the story that has been unfolding since the beginning. A story that has long been in motion on that day in Antioch when a ragtag group of people were first called Christians. Let's pray together. God, as we in this moment speak to you, we recognize that this is one prayer, that I am only one voice, that we are only one group in a long history of your relationship with, your reaching out to, your involvement with humanity. Give us eyes to see that all that we say and all that we do is only one part in a longer ongoing conversation between you and us. I ask that you would cause us to look at these early Christians to understand more about our family, as it were, so that we might understand the larger story we're a part of and in doing so, be more faithful to this tradition that we've been invited into. I ask that in seeing that we are one part of a larger whole, that that would bring to us humility, wisdom, discernment, joy, and a greater love for you and for others. We pray these things together in the strong name of the Jesus we follow. And all my friends online said, amen. Would you join me as we speak together a prayer of confession and assurance? Almighty, and most merciful God, we confess that we have fallen short in love, in word, in thought, and in deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. God, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image to the glory of your name. Amen. Remember that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you belong. to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to him saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. God, we thank you for the gift of communion, for the gift of your love, we lift up our hearts now to you and receive. Now, I invite you to take your bread and remember that this is Christ's body broken for you. As you dip the bread in the wine or juice, remember, this is Christ's blood poured out for you. Thank you. 
gift to be with you today. As you go, I invite you to receive this blessing from Teresa of Avila. May today there be peace within. May you trust God that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content knowing you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise, and love. It is there for each and every one of us. Peace be with you.